Severance Suzuki's speech is a very effective use of voice because straight away she establishes that she's speaking from the perspective of a child. So her main sort of purpose in speaking was to say that there's some things wrong with the world and that it's the political leaders that are responsible for trying to fix them. Um, and it's like a child speaking to an adult. Um, at, at, and at times she's actually been quite critical of them um, but the, the various techniques that she uses actually um, you know, probably engages them just as much as it engages us. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of an older text, you know, it was written in or, or spoken in 1992 um, at the plenary ses session. Um, so there's a lot of world leaders there and she's speaking uh, about the environment, but she sort of probably doesn't just uh, limit herself to the environment. She goes a little bit out of that. So let's go through the speech uh, slowly. Firstly, like obviously, she introduces herself um, and gives uh, the context of who she's speaking for in terms of the Environmental Children's Organization. Uh, like I said, she quickly establishes that she's um, you know, uh, 12, 13, um, and that she's um, representing you know, a few of her friends. But uh, as you'll see, she's representing more than just those three friends mentioned in the uh, first paragraph. The big um, sort of point that I think she makes in, in that first paragraph is that she's trying to make a difference. And this immediately uh, asserts what the uh, purpose of the speech is. So I like that, that, that when she goes into a second paragraph, that she's not looking for any help to make this statement. You know, the group, they raise the money themselves um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they covered 6,000 miles to get there. Okay, so... This is how important it is to them, you know, that they're willing to spend money and they're willing to travel a long way uh, to make sure that their voice is heard. Um, and then she really addresses specifically this audience to tell you adults, okay, and that's where she really establishes that this is the voice of the younger generation speaking to the older generation. And her message is that you must change your ways. So the use of high modality language and the hyperbole here, um, it, it creates a real call to action, um, you know, by the, the people uh, in power or, or requires them to do something. She then sort of asserts that she's got no hidden agenda, okay? And you start to see that she, she drifts between inclusive language uh, using we and sometimes she uses personal pronoun. The personal pronoun creates a, like an emotional sort of connection and the we sort of shows that she's speaking for more than herself. So she sort of drifts in between those two things intentionally. So no hidden agenda. She's not here to, to, to make money. She's here to, to express her point of view. And her point of view in this very truncated sort of sentence is, I am fighting for my future. Um, so that, like I said, the personal pronoun creates an emotional connection. Um, but the simplicity of, of the, the sentence mirrors the simplicity of the voice and the message. Okay, she's not trying to complicate or confuse things. She's just trying to establish her ideas really, really clearly. Then uh, she goes on to uh, try to connect with them a little bit um, as an audience. Losing my future is, is not like losing an election or a few points on the stock market, which is something that the audience and the political leaders may have, well, particularly the election, uh, and some of them may play the stock market, they'd be able to relate with that, okay? And that's a, a smart sort of strategy by her to use. Um, then she goes on to say, and this is what I mean about speaking for more than herself, I'm here to speak for all generations to come. So not only is she speaking for all 12 year olds or all children, um, she's speaking for children that just aren't even born yet, okay? So the generations to come, and uh, I guess that uh, emphasizes the importance of the message that she's trying to make. Uh, and to some degree, you know, I, I think there's a hyperbole used there and uh, it's used effectively. Then she goes on to talk about specifically who she's speaking for. So she's here to speak for starving children around the world. Uh, and you know, that, that's very emotive, okay? I think we can really imagine, um, you know, people, uh, young children that, that don't have enough food. And we've seen, um, e even in, you know, 1992, when the, the speech was sort of um, said at this uh, Earth session, um, we know as a, as a people uh, what that looks like, okay? We've actually sort of seen it, um, and I think that that makes it um, a lot more powerful. I love this little line here where she then goes on to say, um, whose cries go unheard. So she's speaking for the spe speechless, you know, for, for people who don't have a voice. So she uses her voice uh, for them. And I think that that's a pretty, a pretty noble thing. And it's also a pretty important thing in terms of the context of, of what we're studying in terms of distinctive voices. She's using her voice for those that don't have one. 
Uh, and that, again, is sort of confirmed by the countless animals dying across the planet um, because they don't have a voice as well. So she, she you know, does that twice. I love the use of anaphora there too. Um, you know, that phraseology at the start, I'm here to speak. Um, and that really emphasizes that her voice is being used, um, you know, for, for others, not just for herself. Then she goes on to make her, her final sort of statement in this particular line, and that is, we cannot afford to be not heard. It's a bit of a clunky sentence, which is, um, you know, which reflects the age of the speaker, to be honest. But the urgency uh, of her message is really, really obvious there. And there's a real demand, um, a plea that, that something changes. All right, then as we go on, we see that um, she then sort of makes a pretty big statement. I'm afraid to go out in the sun. Um, and again, there's that real uh, emotion, um, and she uses I am afraid again in the next sentence, you know, creates this sort of anaphora again. Um, but that's a, a real, you know, exaggeration that she doesn't want to go out in the sun because of the holes in the ozone layer. But again, during that time, you know, that was a big uh, sort of idea about the ozone layer and, and you know, cancer being more prevalent because of the fact that, um, you know, the, the sun and the UV rays weren't being, you know, sort of shielded from us. So again, you know, that she's making some pretty bold statements to try and uh, really, you know, unsettle the audience uh, and these adults. Um, afraid to breathe the air, and, and again, the reason is, you know, because of the chemicals. And again, like these frighten us, uh, you know, as a, a listener who's not there, uh, as a world leader hearing it, you know, secondhand, that still makes you feel like, wow, holes in the ozone layer, chemicals in the air, they're, they're definitely not uh, positive things. Then you see um, where she shifts then from these, what I would say are real global issues to some really sort of um, local issues that, that she's suffering in her home in Vancouver in Canada. So she talks about uh, the, the fact that she used to go fishing with her dad um, and this personal experience again allows us to engage and, and create a relationship with her and, and the voice that, that she's using in it and it gives an authenticity um, you know, to her voice. And, and the fact that she found uh, the fish full of cancers, um, you know, again, emotionally, it, it makes us invested in what she's saying. Um, and, and then she sort of goes from that local experience to a more global experience that animals and plants are, ex you know, going extinct all the time. Um, and then, you know, this sort of last sort of line of this paragraph, vanishing forever. Um, and I, I guess, like you know, I, I'll call that a hyperbole um, because I think she's using it to exaggerate the reality uh, of what's happening. But I guess, in, in some ways, in, when they are extinct, that is, they're gone forever. Okay, and that exaggeration is, is actually quite accurate. Then um, she again goes back to some personal experience experiences, so things that have happened in her life. Uh, and things that she wanted to see, okay, so things like the great herds and, and, and the jungles and the rainforests, um, and there's a bit of accumulation there of, of things that she would love to experience, uh, but now she she wonders about their existence, and again, this hyperbole exaggerates that um, we're going to destroy the best parts of the world for our future generations, and remember, she she's speaking for those future generations, those that aren't yet born. Then she asks this great rhetorical question, did you have to worry about these little things when you were my age? And there's a real accusatory tone to, to that rhetorical question um, where she starts to really sort of say to, to the audience who are full of these world leaders, you know, you didn't have that concern. You know, that, that she's, she's asserting that they didn't have to worry about these things because uh, these things weren't a reality uh, and that they're responsible for making them a reality so there's, there's a massive accusation being made there and she's using her voice to really try and trying to generate change um you know in these people that have the power to make decisions so then she she goes on to sort of assert that this is happening you know before our eyes it's really going on um and the fact that we act as if we've got all the time and we want and all the solutions again continues to accuse um, and it argues that, that adults think that they know what they're doing, but in fact, if the world continues to get worse, well, potentially, uh, they don't know what they're doing. Um, and that's, that's more the concern that she's trying to, to generate to them, that she's not confident about what they know. Then she gets back to this sort of 
she wants to reiterate again, you know, and this is the voice of a child, you know, that I, that she's using. I'm only a child, and she says this repetitively throughout um, the text. She doesn't have the solutions, um, but what she wants to say to them is, "But oh, I don't feel like you do either." And even that, like you know, sort of um, exclamation mark at the end of that sentence, you know, you can feel when she's speaking, when you listen to it, that there's that real emphasis that that you don't know what you're doing. Um, and then she uses the anaphora to really back that up. You don't know how to. Um, and, and she talks about, again, a, a thing that she spoke about before, you know, fixing the holes in, in, in our ozone layer um, and bringing salmon back up a stream. Um, so, you know, again, this anaphora um, gives, it, gives her voice power and authority, okay? She, she's demanding change uh, from these world leaders because they don't know uh, what they're doing. Then, um, you know, we, we get back to this sort of, um, th this continuation of the anaphora, you don't know. Um, and, and again, she goes back to something she's already mentioned, gives us uh, that cyclical nature in the poem that you don't know how to bring back um, extinct animals. Uh, you can't bring back the forest, forest that once grew uh, and where there is now desert, okay? So again, like she, she's making these contrasts, you know, that, that these things are gone um, and you don't know how to bring them back and that high modality uh, language again, you know, sort of further emphasizes this real accusatory tone, and she's laying, you know, colloquially what we'd say, you know, a real guilt trip on, on these leaders, uh, making them feel really, really bad about their role uh, in potentially destroying the world. Then she makes this um, you know, sort of bold statement, you know, she really wants uh, something from the leaders, and she says, you know, if you don't know how to fix it, and, and again, you see the exclamation mark at the end of this statement, please stop breaking it. So at the very least, please stop making it worse um, and at least try and stop that and then try and think about fixing it as well. Then you see she gets back to the point about you know, her, her audience and who they are um, and she sort of says, you know, you are, your delegates, your government, your business, your organisers, your reporters, your politicians, you know, you're really, really important people and that accumulation sort of shows the, uh, you know, the type of people that she, that are in this room listening to us, some really, really important people, people who can make uh, decisions. But then she wants to bring it back again to that emotional level. But really, you are mothers, fathers, brothers. You know, All of you are somebody's child. She's trying to really reconnect with that sort of childlike voice and, and the, the innocence of, of a child. And um, you know, She really tries to connect them back to the things that are important, not maybe the global issues, but the little people that are affected by those global issues. So you see that you know, really clear juxtaposition. Um, it establishes that we're all a part of this global community. Um, and I think that that's, that our, we don't have just one role in our lives. We've got multiple roles, uh, no matter who we are. Um, and that, again, that emotional uh, sort of voice, you know, that gets it back to that personal level. And even the fact that that commonality that we all have, that we were once children. Um, and, and it allows us to listen to her as the child, but also to basically hear our own inner child voice uh, and try and connect back with that. So again, here you see this emphasis where she reasserts, I'm only a child, yet I know we are all part of a family. You know, And, and again, that, that global community is really emphasized there. 5 billion strong, in fact, 30 million species strong. Again, emphasizes lots of us. Um, but then she, she shows us that we're broad and there's lots of us, but then gets back to this connectivity uh, between us all. We, are all. we all share the same uh, air, water, and soil. Um, so the use of we you know, brings us back to this inclusivity, um, binds us together, and gives the sense of her voice being you know, for a common cause uh, for all of us, not, not excluding anyone. Then the idea that um, you know, borders, governments, decision making, you know, like whatever happens, laws, that, that, that's not going to change the fact that we share uh, the environment. Okay, so we might be able to make money and economics and stuff like that, but the, the earth itself is, is what is common to us all. Then she uh, gets back to this sort of thing again. Um, I'm only a child. You know, she's she really emphasizing you know, that, that, that her voice comes from the perspective of a child. Yet I know we are all in this together. Okay, so she, again, I, personal, but then we are, okay, back to that inclusive language and that common goal. 
Um, and then this, this sort of really sort of simple statement, but we should act as one single word, world towards one single goal. It's not, not brain science, uh, brain surgery, or it's not like, you know, really complicated what she's saying, but it's so accurate. Okay. And it has such, you know, sort of vivid meaning. Then, uh, she goes on to, to sort of finish this paragraph very strongly in my anger, I am not blind. And in my fear, I'm not afraid to tell the world how I feel. So she's angry and scared. You know, she's, she's admitting that. She's afraid. Um, but she is not going to let this stand in the way of her saying what she needs to say because it's so important uh, what she's going to communicate to these leaders. So um, despite the fact that, that she's angry and, and, and afraid of what's going to happen in the future, she feels that she doesn't want to um, just keep quiet and accept what is happening. She wants to challenge it. Okay? And that's where that sort of accusatory tone has been throughout her uh, speech. Then she says, um, you know, gets back again to that sort of local community, back to um, Canada. In my country, we, we make so much waste, we buy and throw away. Um, and yet, northern countries will not share with the needy. So, you know, the, the developed world, we're not giving to people who, who have greater needs, yet we waste so much. And, you know, look, Australia as a developed country would be part of that. Even when we have more than enough, we're, we're too afraid to share. You know, we, we, we want to keep our wealth. Um, and, and again, I think that there's this call for humanity to change our mentality about what we think about the world. If we've got enough, why don't we share with those who don't? And you see that, that she um, goes beyond just the, the environment here, um, and, and she has done throughout her, her response or throughout her speech, where she's tried to really focus on um, more global social issues uh, as well as um, as well as the, you know the environment, so I, I think like she does a good job in that in that respect that she doesn't just focus on um, the environment, but she t looks at, at at you know more holistic world problems. So like I said, she she gets back to um you know that local sort of feel in Canada, you know, and she she talks about her own experience. We live privileged life, plenty of water, plenty of food, shelter. Um, then she looks at these material things that they have. We we have the watches, the bicycles, the computers. Um, and these things aren't needs. Uh, these are just um, things that, that we, we acquire in, in the developed world. And uh, essentially, we, we think that they're pretty important. But then she goes back to this really, you know, so she looks at this local, you know, sort of experience in Canada and comes back really to this much smaller experience of, of her travels in, in Brazil, you know, but just before she makes this speech. So just two days ago, we were shocked. Uh, at what we saw in terms of living conditions for children in Brazil. And again, um, this sort of bringing back together to uh, personal experiences that she's had and just had, again, gives her voice that, that authenticity that we're looking for. And again, it's emotional. It engages us. Um, remember that her audience sitting in front of her have been in Brazil with her and they potentially have seen this same thing. Um, and look at this like great emotional line. This is what one child told us. Uh, I wish I was rich, okay? And if I were, what would I do? I'd give all these children the things that they need. Not televisions, not bicycles. She, he'd give them, or, or he or she would give them food, clothes, medicine, shelter, love, affection, the basic necessities uh, of life. And that accumulation um, of those really important things that we need in life, uh, juxtaposed to the things that in Canada um, you know, we desire to have, and, and like I said, not just Canada but in the developed world, um, you know, very strongly worded and, and very effective uh, sort of way of communicating her ideas. Then she talks about this child, and again, like, you know, she almost changes her voice here and, and speaks, uses his voice, okay? and, and even the quote there does obviously use his voice, and, and that shows, again, that it, she's, it's not about her, it's about the voice that she's trying to communicate for others, and she gives this kid a voice, um, like she said she would, uh, the starving children, she's given this, this young boy or this young girl a voice. So if this child is willing to share, then the rhetorical question comes in. Why, when we've got so much, are we still greedy? And it really challenges us to consider who we are as people and our own humanity and why we do this. Remembering, too, that a lot of these, um, you know, sort of business leaders and political leaders, you know, the economy is very important to them. So, you know, she's really, you know, trying to challenge their way of thinking. So then again, she, she says, oh, I can't stop thinking that these children are my age that it makes a tremendous difference where you're born, that she's very, very lucky uh, to have been born in Canada and 
have lived the life that she's led, um, even though these young people haven't. Then when she makes this statement, I could be one of those children living in, in Rio. I could be a child starving in Somalia, a victim of war in the Middle East, a beggar in India. And again, she incu- accumulates all these injustices um, that are being felt. And again, she's, she's being an advocate uh, for those people that don't have a voice. Um, and she's saying that it's not, it's not fair um, that they have to live in a world like this at 12 years old when she doesn't have to and, and that she has to use her voice to try and speak for them because there is a massive injustice being done here. Again, she reasserts, I'm only a child, um, you know, just wants to get back to some logical things that she sees as a 12-year-old. This is how These are the things that she believes could be the answer. Maybe we should spend less money on war. You know, it seems like a, a simple thing to do when we've got uh, the experiences of those children in, in the previous sort of paragraph. And then if we spent that money that we saved on, on ending poverty and, and looking after the environment, wouldn't the world be, be better? And look, of course, it's a, it's a simple but true statement. Okay? And again, I think because it is a child's voice, the, the 12-year-old, she can say these simple things. And, you know, the leaders might say, oh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But when it comes out of the voice or, you know, out of the, the mouth of a 12-year-old, it's hard to argue with. Then she gets back to, um, again, like, you know, her, her sort of own experience of school. And again, I think that this is really powerful. At school, even in kindergarten, you teach us to behave in the world. Okay, you teach us these things. And she dot points them, like, you know, she, she just slows down and... and says these rules you know, that we all learn in kindergarten uh, and, and lets you sort of uh, think about them. Don't fight. Very simple, very true. Uh, when you do fight, work things out. Okay, again, you know, there's not, nothing complicated about that. Be respectful. All right, again, that's something we're all taught and it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, if you make a mess, clean it up. It's your responsibility. So, you know, again, responsibility is an important thing to learn in kindergarten. Um, don't hurt other creatures. You know, a lot of a lot of kindergarten classes have a, an animal or a, you know something in there that they look after to learn that sort of um, that important sort of skill and that important principle. Uh, and to share, don't be greedy. You know, we we all always uh, sort of were told that in kindergarten to share our toys and make sure that everyone's included. So these are basic, uh, simple sort of ideas. Uh, and again, the voice of a child comes through very very clearly here in in these simple kindergarten rules. And when we look at them, they're logical, they make sense, and they're a me- metaphor for how the world should be run. Um, you know, and when you make that metaphor sort of real, you think about fighting with others, you know, don't, don't go to war. The war and conflict is, is not something that we should be doing in our world. It's, it's against our basic principles as humans. Um, when, we, when we have disagreements, like, let's go and talk about it and work things out. Let's not go and you know, throw bombs and, and kill people. Show respect to people. Probably a lot of the wars and a lot of the arguments come from a lack of respect, uh, a misunderstanding about you know religious beliefs and uh, different aspects of, of culture. Um, clean up our mess. You know, if you know around this time there are a lot of environmental disasters. Um, companies didn't want to take responsibility for them. Uh, there was a lot of dumping of toxic waste and things like this into the waterways and into the oceans of the world. Um, people didn't seem to be using that philosophy of cleaning up the mess that they created. And obviously when they did that, a lot of creatures were hurt um, you know, by their decisions. This one about the economy and, and not being greedy, well, you know, in, in the late 80s and, and mid 80s, just before this speech, you know, there was just a massive splurge of, of people trying to get rich um, at any consequence. So you see there that Suzuki, uh, again, does a good job to you know, make things a little bit more basic to us, um, simplify things. And, and she can because her voice is a child. She doesn't need to be complicated. Then she goes back um, to this accusatory tone and, and uses the rhetorical question to try and really make them think about the uh, kindergarten sort of philosophies that she's just mentioned. So why, as leaders, and she speaks to them, do you go out and do the things that you told us that we shouldn't be doing? So, you know, that contradiction uh, that from the leaders is very powerfully sort of portrayed there in the speech. Then, you know, she, she asks, um, again, for them to reflect on their own involvement in, in this particular conference. You know, 
don't forget why you're here. Um, you know, who are you doing this for? Okay, we are your own children. So, you know, brings it back again to this connection uh, between the leaders and these, you know, sort of people that are in, in the audience to, to the whole world, that they've got a responsibility uh, to us uh, as their children, whether it be through blood relation or through the fact that we're just all human beings. Um, that's what she's trying to say. We're all one people and we need your help. We need you to look after us uh, and not hurt us uh, like you're currently doing. And even this sort of, you know, reassertion that you are deciding what kind of world we will grow up in. You know, it's an awesome responsibility on these people. And, and she's say, basically putting it in their face and saying, hey, this is a really big responsibility you have. Don't stuff it up. Um, you know, parents should be able to comfort their children by saying these things before they go to bed each night. Everything is going to be all right. We're doing the best we can. It's not the end of the world. But then she, she flips that because that are, those are things that parents say to their kids before they go to bed. And she says, but I don't think you can say that to us because that's not true. It, it could be the end of the world and maybe you're not doing the best you can. So again, she, she contradicts the statements she made to try, try and accuse the leaders of not doing enough. Then she asks a, another rhetorical question that they've really got to contemplate and sit with. Are, are we on your list of priorities? Are we important? Um, and again, that question, I think, really makes them think, well, are the decisions I'm making for the young people in my communities? Uh, am I doing uh, what, what I should be doing? Uh, and again, there's a real challenge there uh, to her, uh, sorry, to the leaders. Um, so then she gets back to her father and, and you know, again, this, this real personal sort of connection with the audience and says, you know, you are what you do, not what you say. So, you know, she gives this philosophical point of view from her father. Um, and it's, it's really, again, it's a simple philosophy. You are what you do, not what you say. So don't talk about m making the world better. Don't talk about fixing it. Go and fix it. Go and make things better. Uh, because the reason why they have to do that is, is you know, what she's feeling. You know, what you do makes me cry. Uh, again, that real emotional sort of blackmail that she's trying to use on them. You grown up say you love us. I challenge you. Please make your actions reflect your words. So she gets back to her father's statement and, and says, you know, I'm, I'm asking you, if you say you love me and you say you love us children, you love, you know, you, you're you doing this for the right reasons, act, act now, you know, speak about it and then act. So, you know, there's a real call to action again uh, by the end of the speech and, um, you know, then she thanks them for, for listening, but she's really challenged them to do a lot more than they're currently doing. Uh, and that was what she said she would do right at the start of the speech.